Well, I hope you're enjoying your lunch. Thank you for inviting me here today. And I hope I won't uh, put you to sleep with all your calories. What is a futurist? What's a catalyst in biological technologies? Basically, I live a few minutes into the future. Most of my friends say, when we first listen to Andrew, it all sounds crazy. But then a few years later, it becomes real. So this isn't going to be a deep dive into any one particular technology. It's going to be an introduction into my world and some of the stuff that I'm seeing. And hopefully, little nuggets of what I say here today will be helpful to you personally or in your business or your region. We all know that mobile is changing the world. This little device, I'm sure you've got one in your pockets or purses, it's radically changed society just in the last 10 years. It's funny, though, because people know more about their cell phones than their cells. We are, I guarantee, the only thing we all have in common is that we're alive. And every living thing is based on the unit of the cell. It doesn't matter whether you're a bacterium or larger. This is about to change. Cells are in an incredible technology. They're nanotechnology. They're built from the bottom up. More than that, you need really complex tools to understand them because the cell, even though as a unit it looks relatively simple, they're incredibly complex. In fact, if you start tinkering with cells at all, you're often accused of playing God. We look at the cell as being created by a deity. We've got a new connection, though, these days, and that's we're starting to link ourselves to these electronic technologies in whole new ways. This is the new touch of God. Biological systems, it turns out, actually have analogs in electronic systems. Very similar in terms of architecture. This is surprising. Nature literally evolved from the bottom up. Proteins turn into biochemical reactions, into pathways. Put enough pathways together, you get a living cell. Put enough cells together, you start getting things like tissues, organs, organisms, and then ecosystems. Our electronic systems, as we've developed them, have mirrored this architecture. And today, I work right at the intersection of it. I speak to kids today mainly in the language of computers because they understand it. And for many people, it's not the bright side that they think about. It's the dark side. And I play both sides. A few years ago, we wrote our cybersecurity friend of mine, Mark Goodman, and I sat down and looked at the dark side of these biological technologies because we're all aware that electronic technologies can be hacked. So can biotechnology. So we looked at how do you kill the president and what are the common hacks you might expect in a biological future. Let's just say there's a whole new industry for biosecurity that needs to be formed. So let's put on our virtual biohazard suits and come a little bit closer into my world. We've always looked up as a species. Always. We've, the night sky, when we could still see it, was a real inspiration, not only for our stories of creation, but gave us the first, gave us our physics, <laughs> celestial mechanics, and gave us navigation, gave us an understanding of, of Newtonian physics. But it was only 400 years ago we started to look down. That's when we started to make microscopes. Robert Hooke coined the name cell because the cellular architectures of plants looked like, like monks' quarters. Or today, apartments in San Francisco. <laughs> Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek took the early microscopes like you see here and started to look at all the little creatures that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. And it's absolutely fascinating. Today, the microscope is really the biologist's Hubble telescope. You don't need to blast it off into space. It's all around us. And in fact, just a single drop of pond water under a microscope should be incredibly inspiring to anyone interested in biological systems. It is incredibly dense with life. Our planet teems with life. Every drop of the ocean, our clouds, as deep as we can drill a hole, on every surface, there are microbes. We just don't think about them because they're invisible. I spent a lot of years working with this little organism, E. coli. 
started doing the genetic mapping of the organism years ago, but also understanding its entire metabolic pathways. The organism itself is pretty remarkable. It duplicates itself about every 10 minutes under ideal growth conditions, 10 to 15 minutes. And as you can see just from this time lapse, there is a lot of stuff going on with these organisms. There's a lot happening inside this little creature. It's manufacturing literally thousands of proteins. There are all sorts of feedback systems and sensory systems. I just love these little guys. And one of them overnight can turn into billions. Today everyone talks about 3D printing. This is the ultimate 3D printer. It's also fully programmable. If you take an E. coli cell and squash it, its genome comes out of it. This is, when I first saw these pictures, and you can find them in any biological textbook, I thought, oh, wow. It's like tape, it's like data. That means you can read it, you can write it, you can splice it, you can play with it. And so I switched from computer science, essentially, into biological science. I'm gonna learn how to program and manipulate these little creatures. This is, the human cell isn't that different, just a lot more complex. There's a lot more stuff going on. Now this is the general overview of a human cell. It's laughable in that it's just a cartoon. Like, but this is the way we see these objects most of the time because it takes an electron microscope to go in that close. If you look at our genome, it's very similar to the E. coli genome, just a lot more material a lot more material, packaged much more tighter, much more tightly. A chromosome, if you think about it, is almost like an elastic band that you keep twisting and twisting and get smaller and smaller and smaller, except that you can twist so much DNA into the nucleus of a cell, you can pack six feet of it into, a, into under 100 microns. It's amazing. And it's that code at, that is at the heart of every living thing. It's universal. It's been universal for four billion years, from every single bacterial cell to the largest animals on the planet to every single human being. So DNA code is one of those universals that if you start to get interested in it, can take you just about anywhere in the biological science or clinical science realm. Human cells, again, like bacterial cells, a lot of stuff going on. A lot of activity, they grow and divide a little bit slower than bacteria, but it's absolutely remarkable in terms of the complexity and the processes. And here I freeze a cell in division. You can see its chromosomes condensed, it's segregating one cell becoming two. Remarkable. This happens all the time, billions of times a day in each of our bodies. Now the wiring diagram for these cells is, is incredibly complex because it's all happening in a cellular container. It's not di divided up. It's all, sometimes there's compartments, but this is essentially mm, uh, like a computer running in a vat of soup. Deconvoluting this wiring has been the job of biosciences for really the last hundred years. And we've gotten exceptionally good at it. This is from a metabolic database. This is a high overview of that database, but we've essentially mapped all the biochemical reactions in a eukaryotic cell or bacterial cell. More than that, you can dive into this map and get incredible detail for each metabolic pathway right down to the enzymes that catalyze each reaction. And if you want to go deeper than that, you get into the genetic code. Now, there's so much information here, I don't expect you to really comprehend it. The molecular biology of the cell, which is my Bible, is about 1,500 pages, and it's really just a scratching the surface. But for the purpose of this conversation, you just really need to know that DNA becomes RNA, and RNA becomes the working copy for making proteins, and proteins are the structural units that make everything biological. It's really an incredible process. And this is a, that cartoon understanding is where most people stop. But it's changing. Today we have a new microscope into the biological world, and it's the code that makes us. It's one of the few things that's actually digital that we can understand and look at precisely in a biological system. And it is opening up the entire world of life science to us in ways that were just impossible 20 years ago. The Human Genome Project is one of the few things in genetics that most people have heard of. 
It was conceived in the 1980s, launched in the 1990s with a $3 billion budget. That's when Congress still had some money. It is still the largest life science project ever done in the world. And it's at the core of so much that we do today. It, it literally opened the doors to reading the code, our code, but also the code of every other organism. When I started in genetics, this was how we sequenced DNA. It took radioactive isotopes, x-ray film, chemical reactions that were rather toxic. And if you read a few hundred base pairs of genetic code and made sense of it, you got your PhD. Today, you can sequence hundreds of organisms and not get a PhD because today, this is what a modern sequencing facility looks like. It's just robots doing DNA sequencing, sending the information to computers for downstream analysis with bioinformatics folks. There's different flavors of these devices, different technologies inside of them. One of the more interesting ones is the one seen in this picture. This is from last summer. It was the first DNA sequencing ever done in space at the International Space Station. We couldn't send those big boxes to space. We had to wait for a new technology. The DNA sequencer here in this picture is right there. It's about the size of a USB stick. Plugs directly into a laptop computer, and you can start to sequence really easily. It's called a nanopore sequencer. It took about 20 years to develop this technology. Basically, DNA goes through a little tiny hole in a membrane that's ch and the electrical signature is read directly from across the membrane. This allows you to get a signal that can then be deconvoluted and directly translated into a base call of, of DNA. This is really amazing technology. This is a cyborg device, part biological, part electronic, and it really does work at the nanoscale. It allows you to take a single drop of saliva or blood or a swab and do sequencing in the field. This is a real game-changing technology, and it's just starting to get widely used today. This is a, the latest version of that device. It's called a smidge ion. It really is. You can see how small it is. And you can actually do DNA sequencing just using your phone. So it's becoming really valuable for people like virologists working out in the field. It's also this revolution in technology of DNA sequencing has opened up a whole new industry, direct-to-consumer sequencing like 23andMe, as well as more sophisticated whole genome sequencing. This is a company called Veritas that's been around for a couple of years. It's the first DNA sequencing group that will read your entire genome for under $1,000 and analyze it. I had that done earlier this year. To completely new business models in DNA sequencing. Helix is a company that reads your exome, which is your, essentially your expressed genome, what turns into, what turns into protein. They read it once, and then you can essentially pick and choose from an app store of different analyses. They raised $100 million a couple of years ago. It's one of the, it's one of the most advanced companies in the space. But there's also groups like Natera, if you're doing IVF, that will essentially sequence embryos before implantation to make sure that they're, that they're viable, that they don't have any gross genetic defects or GRAIL, which is using DNA sequencing technology to look for cancer markers circulating in blood. So now you can actually go in for a monthly or bi-yearly blood test and do a, what's called a liquid biopsy, looking for cancer anywhere in the body because some of the telltale cancer DNA is circulating. When you start taking DNA and layering other information on it, tissue samples, information about your life, and organizing it, you essentially produce a biobank. The UK is one of the largest of these, 500,000 500, people as part of this collection. It's not full genome sequencing yet in these, in these biobanks, but this is really powerful, integrating information about you with your genome as a foundation is really incredible. And this is an open source data set. So it's becoming kind of the model for where personalized medicine is going to go in the future. What happens next? 
This is just stuff that's happening today. Well, it's going to get really interesting. Earlier this year, I was with Gary Wolf. He's the founder of an organization called the Quantified Self, Better Living Through Numbers. It's basically people that love tracking different parts of their life. Some people get on a scale every morning and write down their, their weight. Other people wear Fitbits and track their sleep or their exercise. They, they're early quantified selfers. But I said to Gary, I think there's going to be a company that comes along and offers people free genomes the same way we get free email and free social media. And they'll have at least a million members in five years. And he said, no way. Not going to happen. Didn't, didn't expect that from him. I said, money on the table, dude. So we did a $1,000 bet for charity that that will, I'm saying it's going to happen. He says it won't. I plan to win this bet, even if I have to go and found the company. <laughs> I've told him this. And I said, it's in the best interest of quantified selfers that you lose. Here's what's happening, because it turns out now that I'm looking for this, I'm finding a bunch of companies that are getting into this space. It turns out that we can collect a ton of data about people today, because our lives are being increasingly digitized. And then when you start layering on genome and epigenome and, and some of this rare data, it becomes an incredibly powerful data set. And now that the genome, the whole genome is under $1,000, it's just a customer acquisition charge. So we're seeing an entirely new business model appear on this. I'm also seeing this happen at the forefront of health. This is a group that started up not too long ago in San Francisco, aiming to be kind of the Apple store of walk-in clinics. They're pretty modern. The, right now, they've got a sign-up bonus where they'll do your genome. But they also give you free drugs, if they're generic. They give you complete digital profiling, sensors, et cetera, all for $149 a month. This is a really new model, but it's powerful. It's clean. It's so much different than what we've seen in most of the walk-in clinics. I'm really keeping an eye on where this is going. And even more advanced is this man's company. His name is Jun Wang. He used to run the Beijing Genomic Institute, or BGI now. It's one of the biggest sequencing centers in the world. He left 18 months ago, started a company called iCarbonX, essentially to do, collect people's digital lifestyles, pair it with genomics, and do predictive modeling. Six months after launch, it was valued at over a billion dollars. He gave a TED talk earlier this year that raised his profile significantly in the West. But this company is really at the forefront of where personalized medicine is going. And how does this integrate? Avatars. Like, essentially, this is a physical representation of, a, of an avatar. This is not real. This is digitally synthesized by a company called Soul Machines, which is actually building digital brains and AI backends for this. This is going to be the chatbot number that you essentially you know, call for tech support in the future. But this is also what we're starting to do with all your health information. Because when you're made into an avatar, and then you play forward what your life is going to be like if you keep living as you're living and not saying no to that extra dessert, etc. It's really powerful. Now you can see it. But that's just reading and comprehending information, integrating data sets and modeling. The stuff I'm interested in as a genetic scientist is getting creative, is writing. The company I used to work with right out of school, Amgen, made a fortune just writing the code for small proteins that became big sellers. But the technology that we were using 20, over 20 years ago has since become digital. Today, we've got a whole new field that we call Synthetica that has kind of arisen out of this digital biotechnology. And we can pick and choose against all the tree of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and make new, completely new combinations that didn't exist before. This is not GMOs. This is not mm, genetic engineering in any way you might think of genetic engineering today. This is software engineering for life. And it is so much more powerful and interesting. Now, we only have three tools for really manipulating life. One of them is evolution. We're pretty familiar with that. Editing and design. 
Now, if you look at evolution, there's, there's, there's no design process. It's just applying selection, human intention to the, to the reproductive process. That's why we have big broiler chickens and giant ears of corn coming out of Iowa. It's why we have all the different dog species, because we've been doing this for thousands of years, selecting different traits. And today, we've automated that process with machines like this that can go through processes where you have organisms growing, typically bacteria. You can sample them in real time. You can start to inject synthetic code into that mixture and supercharge the rate of evolution in these bacterial populations, driving them to a desired endpoint. This is called multiplex genome engineering. Editing is a little more intentional. This is, this is the genetic engineering most people are aware of today, gene splicing. It's over 40 years old. It's called splicing because we used to splice every media back 40 years ago. We used to splice magnetic tape. We used to splice film, very similar. If you look at the biotech industry of 40 years ago, it's pretty much the, where it is today. You're tinkering with life. You still have to go and fight all the folks that are worried about that. And it's also a giant boom industry. And that's probably where you're more interested in. It, it, is, it was booming in the 1970s. It was booming in the 80s. It's booming in the 90s. It's still booming. Today, the leading edge of that boom in editing is CRISPR-Cas9. It's only a five-year-old technology. But it is so precise that editing DNA has become an, an indispensable research tool. And it's already moving rapidly into the clinic. Almost every day, there's new applications. Cancer is an easy one, because you can now target the genetic code of a cancer cell specifically. You can cut it and destroy it. It's one of the best potential cancer therapies we've got. Same ditto with antibiotics. This company, based out of France, takes viruses that typically infect a particular bacterial species, and they put in a CRISPR construct, so it only kills a particular variant of that bacteria. Our guts are filled with E. coli bacteria, but if you have a pathogenic E. coli, an antibiotic can't distinguish. These antibiotics can. Here's a really interesting application that's all poised to hit the clinic soon. This is Luhan Yang. She's one of the co-founders of a company called eGenesis. They're taking pigs, stripping away the endogenous retroviruses in the pig genome, and modifying the pig surface, cell surface markers so that the human immune system doesn't attack it. So they're making essentially a generic pig for transplantation. This is moving to the clinic incredibly fast. Now, we produce a billion pigs a year. This technology gets approved. There's no more, there's no more weights for organs. The, the, the transplant list just goes away overnight. This could be a trillion dollar company. Just the other day, yesterday, CRISPR-Cas9 has been shown to be able to, has been modified so it can actually not, instead of editing genomes, be used to turn parts of our genomes on and off. And so this makes it really useful for in vivo therapies. This is brand new. Like we've never had this level of control over our genome and making it into a therapeutic. And it's also at the heart of something called a gene drive. These are a little more controversial, but this is where we can drive evolution to a, to a dead end. They're starting to use this for mosquito eradication, but they've also proposed it to get rid of things like rats in London. It's even being used as a data archive technology. This is just from earlier this year, where this movie, one of the first movies ever made, was actually encoded into a living bacteria. That's kind of cool, you know, where you might one day be able to carry your medical record inside of your own body. You won't lose it. And of course, we're starting to use this technology to try it on human embryos, to be able to do things like genetic surgeries to repair damaged embryos. This is, this is really edgy stuff. It's got a long way to go before, before we are comfortable with this technology. But I remember the first test tube babies in 1978. Today, there's over 5 million kids born with IVF technologies. It's not controversial anymore. But it's when you can sit down and really start writing DNA code, programming it, 
that things get really interesting. And it's coming faster than most people understand. This is a company called Twist Biosciences in the Bay Area. They are a 3D printer for the DNA molecule. You design DNA on computer, you send it to them, you get a physical strand of DNA back that can, that can directly coordinate the metabolic activities of a living cell. This is digital genetic engineering. It's easy, it's inexpensive, and it gives you tremendous power and control, even compared to tools like CRISPR. There's only been a few scientists in the world that have really taken this technology and run with it hard. One of them is our very own Craig Venter, based out of La Jolla, California. Craig has been at the forefront of genomics since I first met him in the early 90s. He's one of the most remarkable scientists in the world. He also pisses a lot of people off, which is why he doesn't have a Nobel Prize. He's not patient. He's part businessman, part scientist, and a lot of scientists resent that. But he's the first to make a fully engineered bacterial genome, and he did it almost eight years ago, and he's the only other scientist in the world that's made the second fully engineered bacterial genome, written from scratch. It's, the process is familiar to anyone in engineering. Computer design, 3D printed genome, install the genome, test it. The minimal cell, which is a stripped-down racing car version of this synthetic bacterium, has only 473 genes, half a million bits of code, about one-tenth the size of an image on your phone. But still, about a third of the genome, when it was published earlier last year, was still unknown. We still have so much fundamental biochemistry to do to truly understand these systems that we're designing. On the most advanced front is the engineering of the yeast genome. Now, yeast, the same stuff you use for making bread and beer, has a genome of about 12 million base pairs organized into 16 chromosomes, and they are closer to you and me than they are to bacteria. It's about a billion years more evolved than E. coli bacteria. So there's been an international effort running for the last six years to synthesize the entire yeast genome. It's some of the most powerful genetic engineering being done in the world, and chances are you don't even know about it because it doesn't affect your life today. It will. Let's just say beer is going to get a lot more interesting. <laughs> and I'm going to switch gears. I've been using these technologies as well. I prototype. Now, cancer has always been part of my prototyping world because cancer, the money flow from cancer anyway, has powered most of genomics. That's why we did this human genome. It was going to cure cancer. It's, it's why we study the genome. It's the big promise. And yet, we're only now getting close to curing cancer. And it's because finally we're starting to understand what cancer really is. It's like an infection, except not with a microbe or a virus, but with your own damn cells. There's no two cancers that are the same. Sequencing proves this. You look at, so the only way we're going to beat cancer is if we can make personalized cancer medicines. There's no one size fits all approach. That's, that's our lesson in the war on cancer. It's not go and find the best cancer drug in the world. It's go and treat every single cancer individually. And that means you have to make a whole new drug development system. Because this is the way drugs are developed today. Basically, you screen thousands and thousands and thousands of compounds for a lead. You run it through preclinical discovery in your labs, trying to validate the targets. Then eventually you hand it off to clinical trials, phase one, just to figure out dosing and safety. And then phase two, the pivotal, the big one, will it work compared to sugar? And three, starting to scale up to a number of patients so you ha have statistical significance. And then you go forward. And the numbers are staggering here. How much it costs to do this process, how much time it takes, and the failure rate even in phase three. Like, it, it, it's astounding. Out of five drugs coming into phase clinical trial, only one gets approved. An 80% failure rate. And this process can take 10 or 15 years. You need to understand this process is not going to cure cancer. Like, 
period. So I started thinking over a decade ago, how do you 3D print medicines? How can you do it? How can you make a medicine for one person at a time at an affordable price point? It's possible. Now, today you'll hear of CAR-T therapies. CAR-T therapies have just been approved. I'll talk about them in just a moment. But I started working with viral therapies. Essentially, there's something called an oncolytic virus. It's a virus that only infects cancer cells. Won't infect normal cells, only cancer cells. It's like giving cancer cells a cold. But I knew, because of genome synthesis technologies, I would soon be able to design and print entire viral genomes. Talk about getting on an FBI watch list. <laughs> Viruses are just USB sticks for biological cells. I know it has a lot of negative connotations, but really, it's just the software that you load. It's the tool. I started working with this man, Bruce Smith, from the University of Auburn in Alabama. One of the few veterinary scientists I've ever met that was also a virologist and had run clinical trials in dogs for cancer-fighting viruses. I called him up and said, Bruce, how would you like to go digital? Because it took him so long to develop these viruses, there was no way to do it one-off. And using tools that we developed at Autodesk, which makes design software for things like cars and skyscrapers, we designed a virus to in, that would only give dogs with osteosarcoma, a type of bone cancer, uh, essentially uh, a treatment. It would only infect those cells. And we were successful. And then earlier this year, we spun it out to a little startup called Humane Genomics. We're only going to focus on dogs for the moment because we want to build up the technology. But I can tell you this, to go from start to finish, designing, building, and testing a virus for dog cancer, the first time we did it, it took us four months. Granted, we, we had knowledge of, of how to do this because there had already been a clinical trial with this particular virus. It's a canine adenovirus. But it took us four months, and it cost less than $10,000 to do the engineering. And that's probably going to be the most expensive virus I ever make. Here's the cool thing when you start making medicine for one animal or one person at a time. There's a lot of benefits, but the biggest one is that you don't need large-scale manufacturing plants, and you don't need phased clinical trials. Because you do the risk-benefit before you start, the patient is always part of the process because you're using their cancer, their genome, as the starting point for design. And every single treatment is a clinical trial. But it becomes a meta-clinical trial as you start to get more and more patients into the system. Every design is state of the art. You never run out of a new medicine to throw at a cancer. That's a whole different paradigm. People said I was crazy when I first started taking this path. But, as you probably are aware of, just a few months ago, the very first personalized CAR-T therapy was approved by the FDA, and just a few weeks after that, the second one was approved. Personalized medicine is here, and for cancer, it's the way it's going to go. If you're not familiar with these therapies, for the patients that it can help, there is a 95% remission rate. It's like a binary switch. It either works and you're cured, you walk away. That particular cancer will never come back, as far as we know, or it doesn't work and you're SOL. <laughs> they put a money back guarantee on, on that. If it doesn't work, eh, at least you don't have to give us the money. But it's going further than that. We're starting to actually do in vivo gene therapies. This fellow, Brian, has, a, has something called Hunter syndrome. It's a, he needs to take weekly enzymes just to keep his metabolism going. He recently just got a gene therapy a few weeks ago that could prevent that. They'll know in a few months whether it worked. But we're getting so good now targeting viruses inside cells now that we can engineer them with precision that, trust me, viruses are going to be the foundation of the next biotech industry. It's already running into roadblocks because there's so few groups that make GMP-grade viruses that companies, pharma companies, have to basically buy up all the supply. They're getting, they're getting put over a barrel right now and having to pay hundreds of millions of dollars. So just virus engineering, if you can start to solve these issues, is going to be big business for you. Now let me pull back a little bit and just say, what about this whole, all of this is being powered by a field called synthetic biology, which is a shitty name. It's just biology. It's just, it's done with digital tools. 
This is kind of the growth curve of synthetic biology in terms of number of papers and newcomers. We're seeing fewer people come into it because it's growing fast, but, but the number of papers and publications are exploding. Here was my first introduction to synthetic biology, students at MIT. They, it, it, the field grew out of MIT and computer science. And basically, some computer engineers said, I, we want to start programming something more complex. And they started organizing, a, a, a basically, a, a, a program for extramural genetic engineering. And it has grown incredibly fast. I've been part of this process since the second year, uh, deeply involved, and, and more recently as a funder and sponsor. It outgrew MIT a few years ago, and it has moved to the Boston Convention Center, and now it's outgrowing that. Over 3,500 students per year participate in this, and you should see the list of projects. They're PhD worthy. This is what kids are going for today. It's the most exciting area of bioscience. They compete for a trophy. It's all open source. Everyone builds on the work of others, but it's all modular, which is why it's based on a Lego brick. It's not just students, though. It's, it's, it's entrepreneurs, startups. This was a lab in Mountain View, California, that looks like it could be a meth lab, but it was actually a cancer lab running out of a garage. They were afraid to open the garage door because they thought the cops would come. But they got funded and eventually got a real space. This fellow, Cathal Garvey, was working out of a bedroom in, his, in Cork, Ireland, and his mom didn't appreciate it. And, but now he runs a biotech incubator there. Um, really smart guy. Sebastian is a plant molecular biologist, works out of a bedroom in Brooklyn, and he's been tapped by MIT. He's so good at doing this work. Um, he's funded by Patreon. Essentially, people just donating a few dollars a month to his cause. And this fellow, is, his star is rising. His name is Josea Zayner. He used to be a scientist at NASA working in synthetic biology. And then he said, you know, too slow. And he started a company called The Odin that supplies kits. So he essentially sells kits for doing CRISPR on bacteria, kind of like a hobby kit, a chemistry kit, or an electronics kit when you were younger, and a whole genetics lab for about you know, 16, 1700 bucks. That's pretty cool. But he's also a biohacker. And just a few months ago, he injected himself with a CRISPR construct for myostatin. Essentially, you make bigger muscles. And he did this live on Facebook. You know, this is kind of edgy. The FDA already kind of came down and said, these kits are illegal, and we're not happy with this stuff. But Really, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> even, even more interesting in some ways, this fellow, Anthony DeFranco, he's one of the co-founders of something called Open Insulin. Now, you, insulin's been around forever. We, it was one of the first things we cloned. You'd think it would be cheap, but it's not. We sell $25 billion worth of insulin a year. It should be free, but that's because the incentives in biotech are a little skewed. Let's just say they don't always put the patient first. So they're making open source insulin. They're moving very, very close to market. That's going to be a game changer. And now I'm starting to see groups like this. Indie Bio, it's one of the biggest biotech-focused incubators in the world. It's only about three years old. They've already incubated over 70 companies. They give you half a million dollars, essentially. Well, $250,000. Lab space, mentorship, money. And almost every company that comes out of the space, four-month turnaround, has prototypes. Many of them are funded before demo day. And then there's the folks at MIT that started that educational program. What did they do? They didn't do postdocs. That pays under $50,000 a year. They went and founded a company that makes organisms. They've raised almost $200 million. This is the bio lab of the future. If you're a big pharma, you know that. But now it's affordable by small pharma. It's robots that run 24-7. They keep, they keep better notes. You don't have to buy them pizza or beer. <laughs> they run 24-7. And now that we've kind of thrown away the species barrier, you can mix and match genes from just about any organism. This woman, Christina Smokey, one of the finest synthetic biologists in the world based at Stanford, has taken genes from six different organisms and created in yeast the biochemical pathway to make opiates. You don't have to grow poppies anymore and get the latex and process. You can just, again, beer is going to get interesting. <laughs> but it's really bottom up. The biology that touches us every day is what's in front of you. 
It's food. There's a giant field of cellular agriculture that's booming now. Because if you want milk, you don't need a whole cow. If you want a chicken breast, you don't need a whole chicken. So this type of process is just spawning companies left and right. It's early days, but I love the milk one, particularly because I have infant kids. And trust me, formula, not the way to go. But it's also things like tissues. You don't need a cow to get leather anymore. You can just make leather. And more interesting, spider silk. They figured out how to do that at scale, put it in yeast. And this company, Bolt Threads, has already signed major deals with a number of different companies. It's still expensive, but now we can get spider silk at an incredibly low cost. And this, just the material space is booming. This is just kind of an overview of some of the synthetic biology companies that have popped up in the last few years. Healthcare, food and drink, consumer products. And then picks and shovels, things like tools, DNA synthesis, software, et cetera. It's really the most exciting time ever to be in the life science space. I don't care what it is you're doing, from clinic to R&D, it's never been better. And I mean, these companies are raising over a billion dollars a year now. If you have a computer, you can participate. I, I do all my viral engineering without a lab because I know how to daisy chain digital resources together to go from A to Z. I don't want the overheads of a lab. Everything's changing. Besides, it's all miniaturizing. If you think a DNA sequencer is the size of this clicker, soon the synthesizer will get there. Soon the pharmaceutical plant will get there. This is just from like a day or two ago. <laughs> this is a startup based out of UCSF. I was there when they were founding it, and like they had nothing. They just sold for $175 million. Because now if you can program life, you're hot stuff. Because now you can program a cancer cell to die or a yeast cell to make a medicine, et cetera. And if you think that they need your money, no. If you've been tracking Bitcoin, it's gone from vapor to almost $16,000 a coin in the last few years. And then there's Ethereum, which is kind of a generic platform for minting stock in just about anything. So these, if I want to start a biotech company today, all I need is an idea and some people to believe in me. And then basically, I'm public and decentralized. This is a computing platform, not just a coin minting platform. So where do we go in the future? And I know I'm running a little over, but I'm hoping I still have your attention. The problem that we have today is that we can't do genetic engineering at scale because we haven't invested in synthesis the way we have in sequencing. And the reason for that is synthesis scares the shit out of governments. They were worried about the people that would make designer viruses. So right now, we can do under 50,000 base pairs of code. And it's, it's gotten to the point where anyone can do this now. If you're really, really well funded, you're a Craig Venter or a big pharma, you can go up to 10 million base pairs of code. It's expensive because the longer a stretch of DNA that you make, the more it costs in assembly, not synthesis. And larger genomes, plants, animals, you and me, that's science fiction right now. To get over that hump, I am a co-founder of a project called GPWrite. It is the next genome project. I got pissed off that scientists around the world weren't self-organizing to make this project. And I started doing what I do, talking and finally convinced some top scientists to sign on and say it's overdue for the next genome project around synthesis. And I know that we only are interested in people, most of us. So it had to be the human genome project. That, was, that got us a lot of attention fast, a lot of buzz that we were gonna go make designer babies, which we're not. We just wanna be able to design and synthesize complex genomes like the human, but also like the mouse, like the yeast, like the plant. Some tremendous people are involved. The leader of the Yeast Genome Project, George Church, who is a national treasure as far as I'm concerned, and Nancy Kelly, a lawyer, a lawyer who has stood up uh, some incredible organizations in the world, including the New York Genome Center. The Genome Project has caught fire internationally. There are now institutes being given to George Church. GP Wright China was just established. The first center for GP Wright is based out of New York, but there will be one in Boston. There could be one in Scottsdale. It's going to be networked centers of excellence in designer DNA. 
and not just the infrastructure, not just the synthesis tools, but things like standards, ethics, intellectual property, and so on. And once you've got cells, you can make anything. This is, this is mouse ovary tissue that actually produces pups. If you've watched Westworld, it's going to get a little interesting in robotics or Blade Runner 2049. Once you have these ideas kind of put into the world through Hollywood, they, self, they start to manifest. It, it, just because, it just becomes, hey, let's make interesting tools. And when you see stuff like this, you realize we're getting one step closer to being, making these organisms in tanks. It gets even weirder after that. I'll just say we've got a lot to think about. But now, <laughs> with synthesis technologies, nothing has to go extinct anymore. Um, so they're reviving animals. Longevity becomes something you can really do. There's one, these mice are the same age. The one on the right has a little switch put into its genome that basically tells each individual cell, if you get old, eh, take yourself out. Let a new cell come in. We should be thinking about that in all our businesses too. <laughs> Keeps your businesses young and vital. I see 23 year olds starting VC funds, you know, because you can just do it today. She wanted to work on aging as a scientist, but realized, too slow, start a fund. And we're intelligence hacking, too. I just put this in to scare you. Because if, <laughs> if your cat can hack your Mac, yeah, we're, it, it's the end days. On a more positive note, biology is the only technology humanity has that's truly sustainable. It runs on sunlight. It runs on sugar. It, we, we're just scratching the surface of how it can support humanity, but it, it is the most powerful support tool that we've got other than this. I don't want to see rainforests, you know, paved over to go build another iPhone factory. I want to see rainforests really produce all the things we need. Here are just a few places you can start as a community. There's SynBioBeta. It's an organization that's an entrepreneurial hub in synthetic biology. It's grown very quickly. Another one is a new media company created by the founders of Wired magazine. Now they realize it's more like squishy magazine, um, just neolife. It's, it's really worth, if you're not familiar with this stuff, signing up for this. And here are a few books that I just think are really fascinating places to start. Feel free to take a picture. Um, and with that, I'll just thank you so much for your attention. I hope I didn't scare you too much. And all the best in growing your Cure Corridor. Thank you.